Hello, can everyone hear me? Good, it sounds like I'm on. Okay, first up, I want to ask a simple question. Who here studied computer science or something like that? Good, quite a few. Usually a lot of good people I've met have also done like physics and other things as well. Another question, whenever those people were studying computer science, who actually took a module on how to use a profiler? Oh, one. I want to talk to this guy later. <laughs> Another one. Who took a module on how to use a debugger? Again, no one. It's kind of really interesting. Things that we use, or, or we should be using almost every day, we don't get taught. And actually, you sort of think about it, has anyone even been on a training course where they've learned to use a profiler or a debugger or some useful... Th yeah! <laughs> That's not a surprise, Kirk. <laughs> now, have you been on a course where you didn't teach it? <laughs> okay. Well, some of this is what it's coming to is, I feel sometimes a bit like the guys in this picture. You kind of just know something's gone wrong and they should have known a few more things. And the only reason this is kind of working is the heroics of what's going on. So many projects I see end up like this. The only reason to succeed is because of heroics. Not because the practices are correct on the project. And actually by getting some of the right practices in place, I think we'll end up being less like amateurs. Because that's what this feels like. This feels like these guys move stuff and they're amateurs. And so they're just trying. And yet so many projects that we work on ends up a bit like that. So, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of the background to what performance testing is about. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do it actually in Java and some tips and tricks on that. And I'm going to finish up with some gotchas and things to be aware of that are kind of useful. So let's start off with what is performance. Well, it comes down to two things. One of the first things is we're generally interested in throughput. How many units of something can we get through a system in a given period of time? You'll also hear that in bandwidth, like how many sort of bytes per second we can get through, transactions per second, whatever. And we're trying to move large chunks of stuff. What's much more interesting sometimes, especially in the finance space, is what is the latency or response time of a system? So whenever you send it a transaction, how long does it take to respond? And those two are the only main things we're actually interested in. You'll hear a lot talked about performance, but that's kind of what matters. And so how much stuff can we get through, and how quickly does the system respond? Now, systems are very dynamic. They're not static in how this tends to work. So quite often what you'll see is if you record every single transaction that goes through the system and how much time it took, you'll get a histogram that looks something like this, where the bulk of the time your system responds with a certain response time, but there's also weird stuff happens further out. And quite often this weird stuff is really interesting in why we've got that. Also, as we increase load on our system, response time often changes. And this is where it's, it's kind of interesting to know how it happens. And you'll see what's known as the kind of deadly J curve. Most systems exhibit this, where you apply load, everything looks great for a while, and then things start going badly wrong. And that's usually for one of many different reasons. If you design a system really well, and you amortize the cost of the expensive operations, it's actually possible to get this blue curve. Everything eventually will saturate or run out of ability to process, but you can do very really well for a long time. And so a lot of this is what algorithms you use and how you approach the system. So if we have performance, one thing we must know when we're designing any system is how fast is fast enough? We need requirements. And so we need to ask these questions. Is, what is the latency we expect from our system? How fast do we want it to respond? And also, what is the throughput? But those things are also linked. Is how much response time do I want at a given level of throughput? And that should be part of the discussions we're having for most systems. Now, so for some systems, a response time of two seconds is fine. Some other systems, you may be under a microsecond. So it depends what your domain is and what's actually required. But answering these questions up front is really important. There's no point in just saying we want a fast system. What's fast mean? You need a target to work towards.
Another thing I find quite interesting is, does the system you design actually scale with the business? Is it economic? People will very often later on look at a system and sort of work out how does it scale. It's, it's important to think about this up front. So if I add a new node, how many more transactions a second do I get for that adding that node? Many people have no clue what that is for their system. That defines the economics, especially when you're running in very large environments. I spend a lot of my time in one of two spaces. One is at the sort of extreme end of performance in financial and messaging systems, where we're dealing down in single-digit micros and even in nanos today for some of what's going on. And at the other end, very large customers who have got literally nearly a billion customers in one case, who if they can save some time, means a lot less servers and a lot less cost for their business. And this is becoming more and more the case. I'm seeing this more and more all the time. Where there's been an argument for a long time is sort of developer time's expensive, hardware's cheap, throw hardware at the problem. I've got some clients where the hardware is becoming a major issue in some of their data centers. And how they keep the software efficient is one of the best ways they can actually save money. So, I find a really useful thing to do on a project, and I've stolen this idea blatantly from the games industry, is for anything you need a transaction budget. And that's how much time any given transaction is made up of. You make it up in chunks. You find a lot in the games industry, they want to target 60 frames a second. Well, that means you've got 16 milliseconds, you've got a bit extra, but always shave off the bit extra because you want a bit of good response in your system. So you've got to get everything done within that 16 milliseconds. You may want to work out the physics of a game in four milliseconds. You might want to work out your frame buffer refresh rate in another part of that time. Do you split the time up? So on many of our systems, we may have a gateway that we're processing some XML or JSON or HTTP or something through that. We'll be talking to a database. We'll be talking to different things. Break it down into a transaction budget, and then you can see where you're spending your time. It's really interesting if you're able to measure this on a system and look at does it over time change? So that are the percentages of each of those things changing a lot, which can tell you a lot about the algorithms of your system. So just seeing it and having the data is really, really useful. So we've defined the basics of performance. Let's look at how we can do some performance testing. Now, I find that this is unbelievably multifaceted, and there's lots of different terms around. So I want to try and simplify down some of the terms and what's interesting. So basically, what we mean by performance testing is we want to apply load to a system and see how it behaves. First thing we're usually looking at is throughput. So as I apply throughput or I load to my system, does my throughput go up? And a reasonably well-behaved system will behave like this. You'll get a nice linear increase in throughput until a point well, you just can't get any more. You've usually saturated your system at that sort of point. We're also probably be interested in the latency. What's the response time of that system as I apply load? And you tend to get your curves that look like this. You'll also hear the term stress testing. This is different from load testing, and I find people mix this up quite a lot. Well, stress testing is you're trying to find out the point at which it breaks and what happens when it breaks, and typically things start to go wrong. I find it's really interesting to know how system behaves at the point of collapse, because it can tell you an awful lot about how it's actually structured. An ideal system would just continue on a flat line. Very few systems actually achieve that. We also want to look at load at a given level of concurrency. So if I'm going to have one thread hitting something, it will behave quite differently whenever two threads, three threads, four threads, 500 threads hit it, or sockets, or whatever. So it's not just the load from a single point of execution, it's load from multiple points of execution. This shows up contention points in your system. One of the most important things I find quite often is when people test, they don't test for a long enough period. They don't test to find the endurance of their system. So this endurance testing or soak testing you'll hear. At the low end, this is really important for finding out, have you actually warmed your system up sufficiently? For example, Java does not compile methods on the server VM until it's had 10,000 observations within that method. So you have to make sure you've actually warmed it up to compile it. But also testing for longer periods of time. Have I got memory leaks? Have I got structures that are growing unbounded, buffers that are growing unbounded in my system, and watching performance degrade over time? So you've got to test for a period of time. 
what I like to do is I like to build up test suites. And I build them up components at a time, or like building up like an onion. So if I've got an individual component, I can test that on its own as an individual component to be performance tested and profiled. It gives me a nice view of how it works. I can then test multiple components like this, and it gives me the feeling of how my system is built up. I like to think of this like structural engineering. If I was a structural engineer and I didn't know the compression strength of concrete, I didn't know the torsional strength of steel, I wouldn't be in a job very long. Most of us don't even know what our libraries give us, what our databases give us, what our file systems give us, what our CPUs give us. We've got to know these basic building blocks. Roughly, what can we get out of them? You throw a load of transactions at a web server, and if the web server is only returning, say, a couple of hundred requests a second, is that good or is it bad? Most people have no clue. Do you know what the TCP stack underneath can cope for those sides of messages? Do you know what the network cards can cope with? You should be able to extrapolate up roughly what you should be getting out of a system from some of those building blocks. So take those building blocks, understand them, test them, then start combining them. Then you have different tests that sort of show patterns of interaction, and the interactions are very interesting in their own right too. So that's what they build it up, build up this picture, and these all become useful. So imagine I've got a set of tests that tells me what a disk drive can do, what a network device can do, what a particular memory subsystem can do. I can actually take those from project to project, really useful, and they tell me an awful lot about what's going on. You'll find many of our libraries and components are all very similar too. So knowing what that can do is really useful, and we can capacity plan from that. Whenever we test, we quite often want to know the order of an algorithm. This is the one I find most fascinating is, all the people who've been on a computer science course probably all know about big O notation. We look at algorithms and we sort of infer what big O is. Is it going to be log n? Is it going to be order one? Is it going to be whatever? I find it's actually better to measure it and work out reversing it because you find that for many systems, the constants that are in those uh, sort of formulas we have for big O notation can be more important because quite often n is relatively small or n is in a very fixed range. So by measuring with your real data, find out, reverse out what is the order of your algorithm and how it actually behaves for what you're dealing with. So when should we test performance? Kind of next interesting question. I love this quote. It's been attributed to at least two people, like Donald Knuff and Tony Hoare. Most people, if you don't know who Tony Hoare is, Quicksort used to be called Horsort, and Tony was told to change the name of it. <laughs> thought it might actually be better. He spent a lot of time in my part of the world. He was uh, at the university there. But it's kind of interesting to think so that this is like premature optimization. What does it actually mean? And I think people use the, some of these terms as cop-outs. So I said, what does optimization mean? To me, it means you are specializing for a given case. You're going to give up some flexibility. That's really what optimization comes down to. So you're going to choose that I know I'm only dealing with US ASCII, or I know I'm only dealing with UTF-8, rather than I'm going to be dealing with UCS2 or some other format or multiple formats. So sort of choosing that, knowing that, that doesn't mean you're doing weird stuff up front. Knowing your data is a useful thing. And I find that I like to test early and test often for performance. It doesn't mean you change your system, but it's very good to know its characteristics and how it's actually behaving. That is not premature optimization, knowing how your system actually behaves. And to do this, we need new development practices. First up, I say is you should do test-first driven development. It's very useful for many reasons. We've all heard it from the functional point. It's even more important from a performance perspective. The most common mistake I see with performance tests is the performance test is actually not fast enough to test the target code. You get people who build a system, they build a performance test, and the performance test tells them it's too slow. That's not very good. And it's such a simple thing to correct. So if you build against a blank, a system that just returns you a simple value, you can test your test case. Is it fast enough? Then swap in actual system. If you're actually doing test-driven development, it's easier because you design the system, you design the test for the system, then you design the system afterwards, and you've got something useful to do. So it's really important to do tests first. And Kevlin actually described this really well in the talk this morning. Is we're all very good at putting things off till tomorrow, to sometime in the future. It costs so much more in the future. 
and how things are happening, which kind of brings me on to my next point. We'll have heard of the red-green refactor. So we write a test, it goes red because there's no target code for it. We write the code, it goes green. It's all great. We look at the code refactor, we keep it clean. We don't really do a lot to enforce the model of the system in our heads by doing that. I'm a big fan of actually, once I get it working, I'm going to step through it in a debugger. It's a dynamic living thing, our code. And by stepping through it in a debugger, it actually puts the pathways in our heads to understand how we walk through that code, how it works, how it functions, teaches a lot about it. I find that people who do this, whenever we get bugs later on or we have problems with the system, they've got a really strong mental model in their heads for how the code actually works and they can diagnose things much faster. We often don't allow enough time for debugging. When we do estimates, we don't estimate for a debugging time, yet we spend so much time in maintenance and debugging and knowing the system works well. Profiling is the same. Knowing the characteristics of the system, how those components behave, like you'll see how much memory it's using, how long it takes to do it. You can build up a good mental model of the system. So I like to write my tests, write the code, step through it in the debugger. The debugger will probably point out, I should have considered that path through the code. I didn't think of it in my tests. Or actually, that's all kind of extraneous. I shouldn't have that. I run it through a profile. It goes, oh, that's kind of crazy. I shouldn't be allocating that much memory because in the middle of my inner loop, I've got something that's adding strings together or something. These sort of things just jump out at you when you're doing these things regularly. And because of feedback cycles, we've learned from Agile, the tighter the feedback cycle, the easier it is to react to something. If we find stuff out much, much later, we don't know cause and effect. We can change this so quickly if we're doing this regularly and working on this, and then we can refactor and rechange. Like live purring stations, how many people develop on a Mac? Probably lots and lots of fanboys in the room. It's kind of cool. They're nice machines. So imagine I want to come up with, somebody asked me, I want you to plot a route through London driving a truck. And how you go about doing that? Well, I'm going to get my bike out and cycle across London. That's kind of what it's like when you're developing on a Mac. It has a different operating system. It has got different file I.O., different scheduling, different uh, network I.O. Everything's different on it. Now, it's not saying it's bad, but if you're working in the performance space, it's really useful to work on something that's like live. Now, like live, I go further than it's not just the target operating system you're working on. It should be representative hardware. We're all eventually deploying systems that are typically on a Linux box on a two-core server that looks like a pizza box in a data center. You can get something with almost identical hardware that fits on your desk for a couple of thousand pounds. Develop on these things, you get used to the pneuma effects of memory, you get used to the effects of what the operating system is doing, you get tools to actually measure into that operating system to see what's going on. And what's really nice is you get one of those machines with sort of 16, 24, 32 cores, whatever it happens to be that's sitting on your desk, you can run loads of tests in parallel really fast and actually develop fast with quick feedback cycles. So, Get yourself some like live powering stations and work on those rather than just your Macs if you're worried about performance. If you want to hack away in the train and play with stuff occasionally, they're not bad. But I think this is important to have this as part of your arsenal. And when we develop all these tests and we're doing continuous integration, performance tests should be able to fail the build. Because that way we've got the fast feedback cycles and we can address the problems and move on. So let's look at some performance testing in action. So we're going to start small with a micro benchmark. What should it look like? Well, we should have a nice benchmarking framework. I'm going to use something here that's quite caliper-esque in how it works, but there's other interesting frameworks out there. I tend to write micro benchmarking frameworks myself because I think you learn an awful lot from how things work from doing that. But pick up a good framework like caliper. It works perfectly well. But so I have my benchmark. What I want to do here is I want to benchmark a new map implementation that I have written. So first up, I want to declare some variables. And I want to declare the size of the map that's of interest. My framework will let me inject this, so I'm going to actually test it at different sizes, because that's kind of important. I'll come back to mask later on, which is sort of interesting. So I want to initially initialize my new map, create an instance of it, and I'm going to 
create some data for keys and values that I'm going to insert into that map. So let's move on with some setup code. So I've collapsed my declarations, and now I'm just looking at my setup code. Well, let's create my keys and values arrays, nice and big, that we're going to deal with based on the size. Now, size, I like to deal with things that are power of two in size. And I'll explain why in a second, because I'm going to use this mask to let me do some very cheap uh, remainder arithmetic in a second. I want to clear my map, because I actually want to be able to test it multiple times over and over again, because that's actually interesting, and I'll explain why. And I want to populate my default value. So this is the nice, simple thing to do. So I'm going to basically create keys, which are integers, and values, which are just string versions of that integer. Now, that code is not to do with the performance of the map. I'm just going to set it up in advance so it's not going to hurt what's going on. So now if I want to actually time the operation on the map, then the time a single operation is pretty pointless because we want to make sure it's all warmed up and it's behaving correctly. I also want to make sure I test a decent range of data so I get cache misses, I test my algorithms and things correctly. So what I want to do is I want to test a certain number of repetitions. Now, why did I get mask in there? Well, because what I want to do is I want to put things into the map and I want to replace things in the map, just in this one example. So I'm probably going to have repetitions somewhere in the order of tens of millions of times. But my data set, probably for my business, I might be dealing with hundreds of thousands of items. So I'll pre-initialize the hundreds of thousands of items, but I want to go around tens of millions of times. So as I go around my reps, I want to work out the index I'm dealing with based upon the index of the loop but I could use a percent here, and I could percent it on size, and that would give me the remainder. I don't care about the quotient, I just want the remainder, because I can use modulus arithmetic to go around my data set over and over again. Why have I done that, rather than doing a percentage in there? Because, depending on the size of that number, on 64-bit uh, x86 processors, that can be up to 92 cycle instruction that stalls the pipeline for doing division. Division in your code is one of the ways you'll screw up your performance test more than anything, where that becomes a single in cycle instruction to do the mask. Very simple uh, bitwise arithmetic. And if you see some of my other presentations, you'll see kind of why I do that. So now I've got an index I put into my map, my keys and my values, whiz around doing that. And that will give me a good timing for my put operation. Now, I don't want to be putting with the same value and the same key over and over again because it's just going to get a cache miss. Or it's going to get a cache hit over and over again, and that's not very realistic. I want a decent-sized data set to see what's going on. This will become really interesting if you're using those pairing stations now that have got multiple sockets with multiple memory regions and the communications going across internal QPI links in there. If you're on your shiny Mac, there is no QPI links, and you're getting no NUMA-like behaviors for what's going on, so you're not really testing the true effects that you're going to have in production. So let's move on. Let's quickly look at concurrency testing. Now, concurrency testing is interesting in that, except, for example, I've got a queue, and I want to test it with multiple producers, multiple consumers. I'm not just interested in performance. I'll also write two sets of tests. I'll write a set of validating tests and a set of outright performance tests. Because the validating tests usually are very good at finding bugs in concurrent structures. And to do that, I want to look for invariance. So for example, count things in and count them out. If I have a financial system, I want to count up all the money in the system occasionally. It should all add up to the same amount. It can move around a lot, but the actual total should be invariant. And this shows up some interesting bugs. And what we're targeting here is contention. So if I add threads to the system, does my performance go up or go down? And that gives me some interesting characteristics to how it scales. So let's move on to something much more interesting. We've done the micro stuff. I want to move right up my, more to the macro testing. And this is where the real value is. So all that micro testing is kind of useful for like, it's the torsional strength of steel. It's the compression strength of concrete. It doesn't tell you how a whole building is going to behave. It gives you some nice insights to particular things, but it's much more interesting to go up. And this is where the bulk of your testing should be. So let's just say I'm Lord Vader, and I've taken delivery of a new Death Star, and I want to test this. Now, what I want to do is I want to see how well it copes whenever I put it under load. And I want to test it from the outside in. So here we go. We've got some nice X-wing fighters coming in attacking our Death Star. 
Now, these are all kind of uniform, and they're interested in how they behave, and they do some really interesting things to the system. But quite often, in the new modern world, we get automated clients that don't behave like you and I pushing a button. They throw a lot of load at the system down one pipe really hard and really fast, and they will break systems in really new and interesting ways. So you need to be able to test the big clients and the small clients with the different rates. We also want to test them with lots of different types of clients and a whole range of them. Like some of the stuff you can do is you can start to put some of these things on Amazon. You can put all your load clients out on Amazon, throwing loads of traffic at you from lots of different places. I had a client, and we were trying to design a messaging system that could cope with over a million concurrent clients. We found it was really good fun to do this by using lots and lots of machines, because actually managing a million TCP connections is an interesting operating system configuration exercise in the first place that wasn't code. And that was a real shock for them. I got talking to people about ephemeral ports, and they're going, "What's an ephemeral port?" And it's like this whole lesson in sort of building up the basics. We've got too much in the fluffy stuff, and this is great stuff to learn. And it's fun to do this because you actually—I I find people get excited about programming when they start to do this stuff, and they write better code as a result. So, you see, just before I kind of go on, one of the things that I've also noticed is in uh, most systems. People have expectations of where the time is spent. In virtually all systems I've seen and measured, the business logic is a rounding error. There really is no time almost spent in it. We spend all our time in spring configurations, parsing, logging, all sorts of weird transforms that are in for the different frameworks that we add into our code. I turn up at projects, and before someone's even worked out what they're going to do, they're installing Spring, they're installing Hybrid, they're installing. It's like, what? <laughs> Why are we doing all of this? Oh, you don't even know what the business problem is. Anything you put into a system should pay for itself. If it doesn't make things better, why are we putting it into it? I call this CV-driven development or resume-driven development. People seem to want to add frameworks rather than actually solve the problem. <laughs> And one of the biggest problems by far is parsing. We send JSON, XML, whatever its systems. If you actually measure the number of CPU cycles that goes on parsing compared to doing real work, and I also sort of include parsing. It's like you make JDBC calls to a database, and there's a lot of parsing goes on with their, the data you're sending forward and back there all of the time. If you had a system that needs to perform, start checking out binary protocols. It's really good, and please don't ever use Java serialization. It's not designed for an on-the-wire protocol. So we, we put a system under test with all of this. What I find very interesting is if we start measuring with the clients, it skews a lot of what's going on because sometimes. Then parsing the results back ends up taking up the bulk of the time and misleads what's going on. What I like to do is have a separate observer that actually intercepts network traffic. Now this can be as simple as running something like Wireshark and dumping all the data and later on dissecting it, or get yourself a hard. A real-time network probe is a hardware device, or write one yourself if you're kind of that way inclined. But you'll learn an awful lot about. The actual performance of the system, not the performance of these guys. If these guys are doing the measurements, so for example, I'm developing a low latency system, and I throw an order from one of these, I get a response back from the order. As the, as I'm parsing the response, what happens if a GC pause happens here, and I end up recording that? Is that telling me anything about this system? It's telling me a lot about the GC pauses over here, and misleading a lot of what's going on. So. If you can capture the network traffic, it tells you a lot more about what this system is actually doing. So, now, what have I learned from performance testing through a lot of this? Two things, really: a lot of technical stuff and a lot of cultural stuff. I'm going to just go into this for a second. So, technical stuff. I find most people don't really understand how to measure latency. And some really good talks by Gil Tenney on how not to measure latency, and some good tips on it. He does a whole R on this alone, but it's it's very interesting that if you think you're going to throw millions and millions of orders at a system, how do you measure each of them and record them? If you don't know how to do that, check out histograms. There's a number of really good implementations of histograms out there that let you capture everything. 
whatever you do, don't sample a system. Sampling is a way to hide all manner of evils. If you sample like one in a thousand or whatever, you're missing all the outliers when things goes nasty, goes wrong, and goes interesting. You need to capture every data point for every order. And you do that by putting the results into a histogram. Like if you think one in a thousand of things go really weird and wrong, but you're only sampling one in a thousand, you're not going to see it. You're just not going to see the problems in your system. And the outliers is interesting stuff. What's going on over here? will tell you so much more about the system. I've learned this over and over again. A lot of I spend is, how do I get latency better in the system? And by better, we often mean get rid of this. I'm not trying to go faster. I'm not going to try and bring this down. I'm not going to try and get more throughput. I just want to get rid of this. If I get rid of this, in most systems I work on, that moves over and moves up as a nice byproduct because it usually shows up so much problems in your algorithms and what's going on. So, Knowing what's going on out here is really, really critical. So now that we're measuring, one of the next problems we often find is time. Time can be a real surprise. So if we're in the Java world, we'll be calling system.currenttimemillis is one interesting way of finding out the time. It gives me the absolute time in milliseconds for where I am right now. But that's usually set by things like NTP. Network time protocol, and that corrects what's going on. So sometimes you run a test, time goes backwards. It moves on us. So it's not very good as a way to do it. Also, depending on which operating system you're running on, you get really interesting facts. Because with time, you've got precision, you've got accuracy, and you've got resolution. And most people mix all of those up. So one of the examples on resolution is where it steps forward. What's the step? So say something's in millisecond precision. Accuracy is how, how close it is to the real time. But if we're on millisecond precision, which you're, you're calling with current time nanos, if you're on Windows XP, it only goes forward every 16.7 milliseconds. That's the resolution with which it's going forward, so it's not very good for measuring stuff. I've also found that in virtualized environments, for a long time, Zen used to just, it, it was like sort of giving you a, a made up story for time when you, you ask what's going on. So generally, a better thing to go for is to get a monotonic clock. And in Java, that's going to be calling nano time. So give me the number of nanoseconds from a given point. Now, that's typically implemented as the uptime of the machine. It's monotonic in that it doesn't go backwards, but it has got some issues. So underneath, it's actually using an instruction called RDTSC, which is to read the timestamp counter of the processor. Now, previous to Nihilum processors, that was not invariant. So as the CPU went into power saving states, that would slow down. But everything from Nihilum onwards has now got an invariant TSC. So we can trust that time, and it will go forward. However, it's not synchronized across sockets. So when we're talking about those dual socket machines, we have got no means of keeping that synchronized across the socket. So trying to time things going backwards and forwards between, machine, between sockets and the machine or between machines is interesting. So if you really need to know one-way times, you need to get into things like uh, precision time protocol and PPS and some of that more complicated side. But a simpler solution is just round trip something. So the point of origin of where you start the stop clock, it should be the point will you come back to when you stop the stop clock because you know you're back on the same CPU. So just do round trip times and half them, which is a kind of interesting thing to do it. Also, I found that the cost of getting time varies wildly between operating systems that we're dealing with. So if you're on one of the latest JVMs on a reasonably recent version of Linux, we're talking about sort of the 40 to 60 nanoseconds uh, time period just to call that. That's relatively cheap. You go back a few generations of uh, Red Hat, and you're up into the three to 400 nanoseconds to call to find out what is the current time in nanoseconds. So you, you can't be measuring tiny little things. And what's even worse for the hardware weenies that are here, RDTSC is not an ordered instruction. So x86 is what's known as a total store order processor. So all accesses to memory happen in a defined order and don't happen out of order. But RDTSC is not an ordered instruction. So it can happen anywhere in the instruction stream. So you need to have a sufficient distance. So don't measure one tiny little thing with it. You need to measure a number of things going together.
Something I'm a big fan of is mechanical sympathy. So part of the fun of dealing with this is understand the stack that's underneath. So if you don't want stuff to go fast, like besides understanding your algorithms and the order of your algorithms in your code, understand the JVM. Understand its garbage collector, how its optimizer works. So sort of some of that, and you won't be so surprised in what's going on. Go below that, understand the operating system. It's really good to understand how file systems works, how virtual memory works, how networking works. Some of this stuff is actually not that complicated to understand what you need to know. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to become an operating system developer. You just need to understand the basics of it. So if you, mechanical sympathy comes from motor racing. Jackie Stewart coined it as a term. And he says, to become a great ri racing driver, you've got to work in harmony with the machine and understand it. You don't need to know how to rebuild a gearbox or how to design one, but you should understand the basics of how it works so you get the right sort of characteristics out of it. Like, for example, if you were to drive around your car and you thought it would be nice and comfortable to leave your left foot on the clutch because that's just a nice place to leave it, you wouldn't be showing much sympathy for the clutch in the car. All of a sudden, you start to get this smell of burning brakes or the disc. But that's actually your clutch slipping. So just understanding how some of that stuff works is kind of useful and good to know. And you can go further down under that into the CPUs, how they work. What's really nice at all these levels is there's metrics you can get out to tell you what's going on. The JVM will tell you what assembly instructions it's generating. It will tell you when it's doing GCs. You can get tools that will sort of break that down and make it easy to understand and digest. Operating systems can give you performance counters on lots of what's going on. And you can go down to CPUs, and network cards can give you metrics on what they're actually doing. So you can know what your code is doing to that underlying stack. Once we start getting into this, we need to know how to profile. It really is worthwhile to go back to that sort of red, green, debug, profile, refactor. Get comfortable using these things. They're not scary. And you'll actually learn a lot from them. And at every level, as I mentioned, there are profilers and counters that will tell you a lot of what's going on. Start using them. Start playing with them. Start getting to understand. Throw different data patterns at your code. You just learn so much. I find this over and over again, that if, if people do this, they just write code with less bugs because they've actually taken the time to understand it. Doing this stuff does not slow you down. I find it actually speeds you up because you make less mistakes, you've got a better understanding, and you're not spending lots of time going back and addressing stuff later. Like, don't get obsessed about it. Don't spend your whole day doing it. If you really love it, do it on your own time or as a hobby, which is kind of great. But do a reasonable amount of it in your day-to-day -day work, and it's interesting. Being too predictable. I find this is an interesting one when people write tests. Is they're not actually aware that if your tests are very predictable, runtimes and CPUs are very good at predicting what they should do. And you need to know what your real data is going to do. So for example, we go right down to the CPU. It's got a branch predictor. It keeps statistics on your code, on whether you go one way or another way in a branch, whether you exit a loop at a given point in time. If you throw the same data at it over and over again, it will get that predicted perfectly and will behave in a certain way. You need to throw it data that's realistic because then the branch predictor will get it wrong some of the time, which it should do. You can get those uh, metrics out of the CPUs. I sort of told it before. So I just try a, a command called perfstat, great little tool for Linux. So again, if you're working on your Mac, you're stuffed. You probably don't have access to that. But if you're on a Linux box, type perfstat. If you want lots of interesting data, type minus D, minus D, minus D, and that'll bring you out all of the cache misses and all sorts of interesting stuff as well. Or type perfstat on uh, perf list will actually list everything that perf can give you details on. And it can give you not just CPUs, but events from the operating system and everything that's going on. Kind of really useful and interesting. But one thing it'll tell you is your branch prediction and your cache misses. Cache misses become really important on test sets. I find somebody did a load test and they've got the customer they use for load testing. Guess what? That's going to be in the cache. It's going to be in the cache in your database. It's going to be in the cache in your file system. It's going to be in the cache in your CPUs. It's not going to be realistic for your actual load test of the system. So mix it up. Surprise the system. Surprise your CPU. Surprise your database. Don't be predictable. 
cultural lessons, more than technical lessons. Classic one is people don't follow theory of constraints. There's a lot of interesting reasons for why they don't do this. So the kind of classic is I run my code in the profiler, and everything is ranked in where the time is, and people go, "Oh, I like number two. I know what number two is. That's in code I know. I'm going to go fix." Problem that's ranked number two, not number one, because that's a bit of the code I don't really know. So often you fix number two, and it will make no difference, or even worse, it'll make the code worse. <laughs> you always start with number one, and I've often found that if you fix the thing that is taking the most of your time, the profile underneath completely changes. Things that were in the top five all of a sudden don't even exist anymore because you're just using it in a different set of characteristics. So you must always work on what is the number one thing that's holding your system up, and it's where your investment should be. It's, it's sensible investment. Classic one I see is let's start a performance team, and I think this is a complete anti-pattern. There's many, many good reasons for why this is an anti-pattern. Quite often, the simplest one is there is far more people generating code than the performance people can fix. <laughs> They're just running to try and keep still and trying to keep putting it right, and they don't change the behaviors or get anything right. And it, it's divisive. It, it's like having separate teams for all sorts of different things, like having testing separate and stuff and all. It, it's just it's not right for how we should be operating as humans. We need to be cross-functional. We need to working together towards the same goal. And so, learning about this. Now, I'm not saying don't have performance experts or performance specialists. That's a different thing than having a performance team, because you can have the specialists in the team coaching people, showing good behaviours, taking the level of the team up. That they'll still always probably be the specialist, but they can improve the general approach. Having them off as a separate team, I think, is a really bad cultural pattern. Some things that does work occasionally is to spin off a little bit of an R and D exercise around performance to experiment with techniques to make stuff faster, and that's good to take it out. But you should rotate people through that, and you bring the skills back in, and you got to bring it back in by doing lots of pairing, lots of sort of brown bags over lunch time, spreading the knowledge and what's not. Don't have them off as a separate team doing their own thing. I see this one quite often, and I think it's a cop out. People say, "Not doing performance tests, Yagni. Ain't gonna need it yet." Really? <laughs> It's like take it back to the requirements. That sounds like you haven't worked out what the requirement is for the system. If you, no matter what system you have, it's going to have a performance requirement. There's no system that's devoid of performance requirements. Even if you've got a, a website that's selling chocolates or something, if it takes two minutes to go from page to page, you're not going to sell that much. They're going to put people off, and even a lot. Of, I've seen this with a lot of shopping and browsing sites, where they've actually done better by just making a system more responsive. People will explore more, will do better. So there has to be goals that are in there. So you're going to set the goals for the business. You need the test, and you need to go against it. I think this is an excuse and a cop out that say no, we don't need to do it yet. Even if you've got goals that are easy to hit, have the goals and know that you can hit them, because then you know you're comfortable. Now, I've got one good story on this.、Uh, I started my career, and I, I got really, really lucky. I landed in a company that had a couple of really talented individuals. It was an ex-games developer. He's actually the guy who did the proximity algorithm for Doom. If anybody's old enough to remember、so、Doom, Doom can quake and stuff. This guy done the algorithm for that. Brilliant algorithm designer. And the other guy who sat the other side of me was one of the network kernel Linux engineers. And it was just a kind of great place to learn. And I went through this for like two years, and then I started work on my first corporate site, which was one of the first internet banks in the UK.、And、I was brought in to fix a performance problem that they had, and it turned out that any time more than two users were using the system, they had concurrency problems, and it was a mess, and the thing used to crash, and it just went horribly wrong. I managed to isolate that problem, and the problem was actually teams not working together. They had a transaction processing team, a middle tier team, and a UI team, and they all just blamed each other rather than actually working on it. They actually brought in experts, so NCR brought in experts to help with the transaction processing side. Said it's not their problem. Microsoft brought in people to help with there was an MTS server in the middle tier. I flew in some of the best people from Seattle, and they went, "No, it's not our problem."
and there was some JavaScript and web guys who were doing the front of it, and this is not their problem. It actually turned out the problem was where the Microsoft guys talked to the NCR guys. It's kind of Conway's law in action. Any system will end up the shape of the team that builds it, and it will have the same characteristics of those interactions that are in there. So you've got to sort of work this stuff out, and it does happen. Just to finish off on some more of the lame excuses, classic one I've heard a lot is, it's only startup code. Now, whenever systems go wrong, we talk about mean time to failure and mean time to recovery. Startup is all about recovery. Whenever your system has gone down and your CEO is screaming at you, when are we going to be back up and working again? You're going to really start to regret going, I'll put that slow bit into the startup code. <laughs> it's going to hurt. And actually, that's when customers don't forgive you very well. Whenever they, some of their money's tied up and they're waiting for your site to come back or things to go wrong, there really isn't an excuse for the startup code option. The other thing I quite often hear is, it's only test code. Again, why do people write test code different than production code? That requires two ways of thinking. You've got to actually sort of go, I'm this person now. Oh no, I'm this person writing code in a different way. That's just hard. I, I, I can't do that. I'm just kind of one person who writes code. But also, if you write tests that are fast, it's all about those feedback cycles. If your tests take a long time to run, you don't use them. People start losing faith in the test suites. Kent Back's done some interesting measurements on this, and he's found that I think it's around about three minutes, 40 seconds for a commit build. The team starts to very rapidly lose faith and trust in a commit build that takes more than that time. An acceptance test build that takes more than about 15 minutes starts getting the same characteristics, and then you get team problems. And, and he's just done that by empirical measurement and how people t treat them seriously. So your test code performing is just as important. And one of the, the last ones that's kind of interesting is it's only UI code. If anybody thinks UIs don't need to be performance, really need to read Steve Sauder's uh, high performance websites book, it's absolutely excellent on all the research they've done at Yahoo and actually discovered that the performance of many systems is actually traced to the user interface. He wrote two books in a series, and I'll kind of go on to the link for that now. So that's one of his books. And at that point, I'm going to wrap up and got a few minutes for questions. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is, what's my opinion on test environments versus production environments for testing performance? Uh, I've got a very simple view on that. The test environment should be like production. We now live in a world where we can buy servers that are unbelievably similar. In fact, you probably will buy almost identical kit. You'll, you'll go along today, you'll probably buy an E5 server if you're going to buy something off the rack with two sockets in it. Have a representative subset of that and put it in production. That's one of the things I always recommend to people. If you don't have a good test environment with a good set of test suites, how are you ever going to find your performance problems? You think they do? If you, you get brought into a place to solve a performance problem, and they've got a performance problem in production, and they don't actually know how to recreate it, how are you actually going to know you can actually change it and fix it? So having that harness environment is so vital. And today, it's so easy to buy hardware that's just like live, and running operating systems that are like live. The investment in the tests is bigger than the investment in the hardware. Yes. Mm -hmm. What if you're an outfit that is, let's say, a uh, high frequency trading um, team and you want to just hit an exchange as fast as you can? Is that a problem for performance? Would you tackle things differently if it was just the task you created? So the question is if you don't have requirements, would the requirements is actually to be as fast as possible? Well, in the finance space, there's some teams that do that. So there are some strategies like latency arbitrage trading where being the fastest is an interesting strategy. It's an interesting strategy in that only one wins. It's actually not a very sustainable strategy. What you tend to find in high-frequency trading is to be fast within a range for a type of strategy. So given the type of strategy you're executing, there's usually a window in which it's suitable. If you're outside of that window, you're usually vulnerable. 
but there are a few people that play right at the leading edge. What's interesting is the people who are right at the leading edge are doing stuff that would absolutely terrify you. <laughs> it's not development like you know it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, one of your earlier graphs, you had uh, latency and throughput over load. Mm -hmm. But as load went down, your latency went up slightly. What's good about that? Oh, okay, so uh, I think I know the slide you're talking about. <sighs> Too many slides. That's there. This one here? Okay, so th th these lines are all just independent of each other, so that there's not actually a relationship between any of those. I thought you might have been talking about... Oh, yes. yes. Th th this is something I very often see, and that's usually to do with warm-up of systems. So, for example, your CPU, branch predictor, forgets things after 10 microseconds. <laughs> This is getting down into crazy stuff, and you, you're having interrupts in your system where your cache will be polluted by other things and stuff going on. So what you'll tend to get is latency will actually improve with a bit of load, and then start to go up again. Virtually all, I kind of call it the, the bathtub curve, where a well-designed system actually behaves like this blue line. It kind of comes down, goes almost completely flat, then begins to saturate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we need to check the scale for down too. Uh, so, for example, you could go with something like Google Protocol buffers, or Kiro, or something like that. It's more towards a binary protocol. They're not as optimal as they could be. But the number of CPU cycles to process an ASCII text protocol is unbelievable. People don't realize. Try writing from scratch, just as an experiment yourself, how to parse a number or a date in text. And I mean, don't use something like the standard library to parse it. Write it all yourself. Do all of the bit shifting and deal with the bytes and see how many cycles it takes to do this. I actually find uh, date parsing is one of the things that takes up almost more time than anything else, because the standard uh, Java symbol date formatter, or even if you use Joda time, are very, very slow. I can write date parsers that are 40 and 50x faster than what you get out of the libraries. And if you're in the low latency, sort of high frequency trading space, everybody's writing those things from scratch because the standard libraries are so unbelievably slow. There's so much we can do to get better. Like the standard libraries could be much, much better. If you take HashMap for Java, you compare it to the .NET dictionary on a two gigabyte uh, size of data for, for keys and values it ends up with a 10x difference in performance. We get too hung up, I think, on some of the syntactic sugar in Java, and we forget that actually some of the lower level features are required in the languages. Like we should have structures, and we should have arrays of structures, and we should have much more control over memory layout. And from that, we could have much greater performance. That's a whole other talk. I think we're time up now. Have we one more? Yes. Yes. So that's a good question. So I had said that sampling is not a very good technique, but a lot of profilers sample. They're doing two different things. When I'm talking about sampling, I'm talking about measurement of transactions in and out of your system. So, for example, I'm going to macro test. So I'm going to do a system level test. I want to time my transactions in and my transactions back. I can t time every single one of those and store the results in a histogram. If I'm profiling, profilers are an observation. that They're not perfect, and they don't give you everything that's going on. And you can use trace-based profilers, but they tend to skew the results so much. All they'll do is tell you how many times a method's been called. They don't give you a true idea of wall clock time for it's been spent. Where sampling profilers are pretty good at actually telling you where the bulk of your time spent. That's different from where are my outliers. Actually, I think 
profilers could be a lot better. I'd like to see profilers that were good at spotting outliers. I'd like to see profilers that tell me hot objects, tell me data access paths through code. There's so much could be done in this area. And I think because we don't think about it enough, because actually nobody's been on a course where you actually learn about profilers at university, we don't tend to use them day in, day out. I find the people who do use them day in, day out find that they're useful, but they're woefully inadequate to what they really should be to make our code better. And I think on that, we're out of time. So thank you very much. <laughs>